Good morning, guys. Uh, it's 11, and so let's continue. Uh, we, in the previous class, uh, we finished discussing uh, conservation of a linear momentum in the Lagrangian formalism, then kind of discussed conservation of angular momentum in a Lagrangian formalism. I just basically told you that it will be very similar, just uh, and one part you uh, have to uh, sort of derive in your homework, right? And of course, I provided the derivation. And then we started discussing conservation of uh, energy, right? We uh, started, but of course, we haven't finished, and now we have to do that, right? So we started looking at uh, some conservative system and some Lagrangian, which describes that conservative system. And of course, since a system is conservative, then of course, uh, its potential energy depends only on coordinates. There shouldn't be any uh, velocity dependence, generalized velocity dependence. Maybe I should emphasize on that. So a uh, conservative system, it means that our potential is the function of coordinates only, right? I will emphasize no q i dots. Because otherwise it will be what is called monogenic system, but we are restricting ourselves to this type of systems. And then, uh, just for fun, at the end of the previous class, right, so we just decided, let's look at the dynamics of this uh, Lagrangian function. So we, we decided to look at uh, dl over uh, dt, right, dl over dt, and after massaging, and of course, we immediately used the fact that system is conservative because we used Lagrange, typical Lagrange equation. And you remember typical Lagrange equation, only applicable if a system is conservative. Since we used it, it means that we are again, we immediately restrict ourselves to uh, conservative systems. So, and after some manipulations, right, so we introduced um, energy function, H, right, which is the function of Q, uh, Q dot and T, and we introduce it in this way. I put three lines, basically that's how we define it. Uh, summation over the whole system, summation over J, uh, right, uh, and then Q, J dot, and partial derivative out of the Lagrangian with respect to Q, J dot. So that's how we introduce the energy. Minus, minus L, yeah, foo. minus L, of course, right. That's how we introduce the energy function, right? Okay, probably I should frame it because it's uh, kind of uh, important. Right. And then, of course, after this introduction, uh, we ended up that the uh, total time derivative of this energy function equals to the uh, minus dl over dt, right? Yeah, minus partial derivative uh, of the Lagrangian with respect to time. So that's, what, that's where we finished in the previous class. And I told you immediately that if Lagrangian doesn't have explicit time dependence, of course, time dependence is possible in Q's and Q dots, but we're talking about explicit time dependence. If, explicit, if Lagrangian is not explicitly time dependent, then of course, immediately it leads to the conservation of uh, energy function. So energy function is uh, the first integral of motion, right? So immediately from here, if Lagrangian is not, does not depend explicitly on time, then H is constant, right? But of course, it's not, uh, it's too early to celebrate that we got conservation of mechanical energy, not yet, not yet, right? So right now, it's just some kind of energy function, which I didn't write, uh, didn't name it energy function. Right, because right now, it's some kind of, a big, big mass. It's difficult to see <laughs> what is inside of this energy function, right? So what's the meaning and so on. So now uh, let's dive into that. In order to see under which additional conditions, energy function is actually energy, total mechanical energy of the system. Because that's the goal. That's what we want to get, right? So for now, it's too early to tell, right? <laughs> right. So. Uh, now let's uh, let's uh, continue massaging this uh, energy function, right? Probably I will um, let me write. So 
Okay, two, 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 two. So let me sort of raise the question uh, under which conditions H is uh, the, the energy is uh, okay. I just don't want to write the total mechanical energy is too much. Okay, I will just write is uh, <coughs> bless you. Right. So basically, that's what uh, now uh, we uh, want to discuss. Okay, so now I will just uh, go back to the definition H, right, and uh, start massaging it. So summation over J, Q, J dot, and partial derivative. Okay, let me just rewrite it first, and then I will start applying what I want. So first, explanation box, where I explain what I'm doing to move from this line, uh, from this point to the next one. So first of all, again, let's use, and now you know what I will emphasize. Condition number one, we already used it. As I said, when we, when we used Lagrange equation to get this energy function, we already used the fact that the system is conservative. Now it's time to reuse it again, that condition, that the system is conservative. All right. Um, conservative system. Conservative um, system. Okay, let me write underneath. And on purpose, I used the red because uh, at the end, we will have to sort of collect all these conditions which we applied in order to uh, sort of develop the procedure, right? So if the system is conservative, then of course uh, this is true. And partial derivative of V with respect to Q, in this case, J dot equals to zero. That's what I wrote here. There is no, uh, no, there is no dependence on the velocities. So derivative of V with respect to Q, J dot must be equal to zero. So as a result, this can be simplified. V can be dropped, so we can have only partial derivative of kinetic energy. So it will be, as a result, summation over J, Q, J dot, partial derivative of L with, oops, oops, not L, now as I said, it's T, kinetic energy, because Lagrangian is T minus V, right? So it will be kinetic energy, um, Q, J dot, and minus L. Okay, good. First simplification. We dumped Lagrangian, now we have only kinetic energy. Now the, it's time to recall another result from chapter one. And uh, when we derived that result, I told you that guys, at some point, uh, several times in the future, we're going to use those results. You remember at the end of chapter one, we wrote down kinetic energy. Uh, we wrote kinetic energy uh, in terms of generalized coordinates. And we saw all possible terms, terms free from the generalized velocities, uh, terms proportional to generalized velocities, and terms which are quadratic in generalized velocities. Now it's time to recall those results, right? Okay, so now let me uh, write equal, and I will open the second explanation box, right? And I'm going to uh, apply the second condition. Right, so now number two. So it's a number one first condition which I applied, now second condition. And now I'm going to write, let's assume that transformation equations from Cartesian coordinates to generalized coordinates, we assume that these are generalized coordinates Qs, right? So transformation equations are time independent. Basically, in simple words, it means if a system is not driven, right? So if there is a motor attached to the loop, right, uh, to the hoop and the beat is sliding, in this case, energy is not isolated, right? The system is driven. But what if uh, transformation equations do not depend on time? Basically means the system is not driven. Okay, so let me write this second condition, transformation equations. Transformation equations are T independent. Right? Okay, so the second condition, and now I will write, so uh, it's a, which subscript I use? I probably, right? It's not big, yeah, R. Ri equals to Ri, which is a function of Q1 
and all the way to Qn, no time dependence, you see? Time is missing. So that's the second um, <coughs> condition that we have to use. Okay, and now, as a result, uh, now chapter one, oh, I mean, ch recall chapter one, right? So if we applied this, okay, maybe I will write show. Now recall chapter one. So in this case, if to, uh, first of all, let me write kinetic energy in general. So it was, you remember, T naught plus T one plus uh, T two, and these terms had these dependencies. Again, dependencies uh, on uh, generalized velocities. That's what we're interested in. So first term, free from generalized velocities. Then the second term, plus, uh, which subscript I use? L, okay. M L Q L dot, right? And the last term, quadratic, one over two. Now it's a double sum, summation over LK, LK, and we will have a tensor MLK and QL dot QK dot. Again, we derived that diligently in chapter one, at the end of chapter one. So it's still related to this box. Just box becomes, would become too big, so I decided to write underneath. <coughs> All right, and under this condition, this term is zero. Again, we showed that in chapter one because uh, this mu naught uh, is proportional to partial derivative of r with respect to time. And this factor, ml, also depends on uh, partial derivative of r with respect to time, which is zero, right? So uh, these two first two uh, terms are zero and only quadratic term survives. Right. So under this condition, our kinetic energy has a quadratic um, structure in terms of uh, generalized velocities, in terms of generalized velocities. Okay, so now let me grab this and plug in, um, in our energy function and I will continue massaging it. Right. So uh, probably I will take one over two outside, I'm thinking, right? this one over two. Right. Um, yeah, let me take it outside, one over two. Then uh, summation over j, right? Then uh, qj dot, I'm just rewriting this. And now that's this construction. Summation over lk, mlk, all right, ql dot, Okay, this L is kind of too barely visible. L, K, Q, L dot, Q, K dot. All right, let me call it, close this bracket and minus L, minus Lagrangian. Right. Okay. So we apply both conditions. And now let's see what we can get out of this. Right. I will continue this line over here. <coughs> All right. Um, ah, d over dt, damn it, d over dt, this uh, derivative, uh, uh, d over dq dot is missing. Uh, right. Okay, sorry, right, so it will be d over dq uh, j dot, right, okay, and now uh, 1 over 2, uh, summation over j, q, j dot. I was afraid to uh, lose any of these uh, sums, but as a result, I forgot to um, write a derivative. Okay, so now let's just differentiate this with respect to q, j dot. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, we have to differentiate with respect to this and then that. Uh, so it will be one over two. Uh, summation q j dot. Now it's just a calculus, no physics, right? It's just all right. Okay, open this bracket. Uh, summation over l k, uh, m l k. Then when we differentiate uh, this q l dot with respect to q j, 
right? So sum here summation over L and J is the some particular index, right? So of course it will give us symbol Kronecker delta L J, which is going to kill summation over L, right? In this, okay? So it will be uh, delta L, okay? L J L J L and J, yeah, delta L J and Q uh, K dot. Right, so it's a after differentiation thing with this uh, of this. Now that plus summation over L K, of course, again M L K. So it will be uh, Q L dot and symbol Kronecker with subscript J and K delta J K. All right. Uh, okay, let me check to make sure that I didn't forget anything. That's that there, there, minus L, minus the Lagrangian. Okay, so again, this symbol Kronecker is going to kill summation over K. So only one term where K equals to J will survive. And here, uh, this symbol Kronecker is going to kill summation over L. Only L equals to uh, J is going to uh, be here. So as a result, one over two summation over J q j dot and let me simplify this <coughs> so as i said summation over l disappears so it will be summation over k only instead of l we'll have j m j k and q k dot so that's what we have from the first sum and of course from the second summation over k will disappear so it will be summation over L only. Instead of K, we're going to have J. So it will be M, L, J, right? And Q, L, dot, right? And minus L, minus the Lagrangian. Oh. A little bit of mess. Uh, but it's not that complicated mass. It's not like a, a D'Alembert's principle in the, in the first lecture. But that's why probably Hamilton's principle is considered more elegant because deriving Lagrange equation from a D'Alembert's principle, it's, it's not the most pleasant experience, All right? Okay, so uh, now I want, I want just uh, take this QJ dot inside. And of course, summation over J, I will bring next to this summation and next to that summation. So again, I will restore uh, double sums. But of course, indices are different. Indices are different. All right. So it will be still one over two outside. And uh, now I will put the bracket over here. So it will be summation over uh, k and j, k and j, right? Uh, m, j, k. Uh, q k dot q j dot okay so i just brought this summation inside and next to this one of course it will be plus summation over uh, l j m l j and q um l dot q j dot all right and minus l and minus the Lagrangian. Ooh. Almost getting very, very close. All right, um, in the outskirt of the uh, of the answer. Now I'm claiming that this summation and this summation are identical. Why? Because you look, all these indices are dummy, as dummy as it, they could be. Basically, they live without this uh, within this sum they don't go outside so we can rename them any way we want right so uh, in this case all right so let me write first uh, l and j are dummy indices right so we can rename them so let's say in the second sum i'm going to name l as you know what let me uh, save space i will write here so instead of l i will use uh, J in this sum. Okay, let me emphasize that I'm talking right now about this only. 
instead of lj and instead of j i will rename it as k and if you look carefully in this case we will have m uh, j k q j, q k dot and q j dot exactly the same two sums okay so now let's just uh, put factor of two in front and the second sum we can uh, we can dump right we can drop it because they are exactly the same right so it will be one over two okay i didn't try it so so uh so the sums are the same Right, so those two sums are exactly identical. Right, so uh, one over two, then a factor of two will appear and summation over kj. I think I use these indices at the end. Let me check. Right. <coughs> yeah, jk, kj, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, so m, j, k, and q, k dot, q, j dot. Right, so that's what we got from here, and minus the Lagrangian. <coughs> so what do we have here in the uh, bracket? So this, <coughs> it's, uh, where is my kinetic energy? Here. Uh, here it's a 1 over 2, that summation, but here, uh, of course, I can include this 1 over 2, but I can also just write that this construction is just a uh, 2 times kinetic energy. And of course, that 2 and that 2 gets cancelled, so basically the same. So that's what we got over there. And as a result, we have what... Um, it will be 1 over 2 times uh, 2 times 2t and minus l so and that is will be of course 2t minus l 2t minus and Lagrangian of course it's a t minus v and we're getting total mechanical energy finally so 2t minus tt minus minus give us plus so we'll get t plus v and of course that is the total mechanical energy finally we got that but in order to get a total mechanical energy out of our energy function that's where we started that's where we end we applied two uh, conditions two restrictions system must be conservative right a second uh, transformation equations are time independent which immediately leads us to what it leads us to the fact that kinetic energy has a, has only quadratic terms so if you look at the kinetic energy of the system and it has a quadratic uh, structure you can tell immediately that uh, transformation equations are time independent so basically uh, these and these they're just basically equivalent so with these two conditions, the energy function is energy. And of course, if uh, originally, if uh, Lagrangian is not, uh, it does not depend on time explicitly, so H is constant. And if these two additional conditions are satisfied, then uh, energy is constant. So that's, uh, we're getting finally to the conservation of mechanical energy under this condition. Okay, so now let me sort of summarize uh, this and uh, we can uh, say goodbye to this chapter. Right. So let me write um, sort of a summary. What are they doing outside in the corridor? Right. Um, so. <coughs> If, so first, if 
I wrote is as I wrote over here if Lagrangian does not depend on time explicitly then h is constant yeah. then uh, h is a constant during the uh, life of the system and if moreover if okay probably let me write first uh, if first uh, system is conservative <coughs> so if oh I can write like this v is not a function of q i dot so conservative and the second condition no time dependence in the transformation equations uh, which were root okay this way oops 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 no 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 <laughs> no dots right <laughs> transformation equations are time independent time independent so under these two additional conditions h equals to e and it's constant h equals to the total mechanical energy and it's a constant of motion yeah. and of course like uh, maybe in a in a few weeks when we'll get to the Hamiltonian formalism we will see that uh, <coughs> Hamilton function will be introduced in a very similar way like an energy function right but of course the difference between energy function and Hamiltonian will be in the fact that uh, energy function is a function of q q dot and t but Hamiltonian will be a function of q p generalized momentum and t otherwise uh, they introduced in, a, in exactly the same way very similar Right, okay, so now we got conservation of mechanical energy under the roof of Lagrangian formalism. And now, uh, enough, enough of this. All right, uh, after a month and a half of these principles, Hamilton's, D'Alembert's, all, all possible Lagrange equations feel like sick and tired, right? So let's take a break from these principles, right, from the Lagrange equations and uh, <clears throat> move to the central force problem yeah. uh, and only after that after this break we will go to the Hamiltonian formalism and we will start diving again in this Hamilton's principle and so on but of course in a with a slightly different flavor right and of course I will explain that flavor all right but for now let's assume that you have okay, uh, someone is back vacuum corridor outside if you hear the noises right. uh, Okay, so let's assume that we have uh, two point masses which moves under the influence of each other only. Basically, the system is isolated and the system is two particles, right? So, and, uh, so the question is uh, how we can describe that motion, right? Of course, we, in undergraduate level course, we solve the problem like this, right? Uh, so we solved also, uh, then we applied uh, for the gravitational um, case of a gravitational force, we solved Kepler's problem, we got elliptical orbits, right, and so on and so forth, right. In the, this course, uh, we need these results in order to discuss scattering. We didn't do scattering in undergraduate level course. But in order to start discussing scattering, we need some results uh, from the um, from the previous semester and actually some results not exactly in that form which we derived in in the, in the previous semester right so uh, as a result um, there will be a little bit of overlapping but I will move faster without getting through the derivations right in order to get what we need to start discussing the scattering process right. okay so there will be maybe like half an hour of, of an of an overlapping with an undergraduate level course okay so now it's time for uh erasing all of this radical erasing 
All right. Yeah, I don't need it all. It's a completely different chapter. And that is chapter three. <clears throat> all right. Markers here. Okay. So uh, chapter three. Central. Uh, force uh, problem, basically two-body problem, right? Two-body problem, central force problem, classical. And yeah, I wanted to say we're going to take a break from the Lagrangian formalism. No, we're still going to apply Lagrangian formalism, but now it's just an application, right? So we're not have, we're we're not going to derive again something from the first principle. <laughs> All right. So let's assume that we have a system. Uh, two point masses, two point masses. Okay. So let's say this is M1. Okay. Let me make it bigger. M1 and here are right, M2. Right. And of course we need to introduce coordinate system and that must be an inertial reference frame because we're going to apply Lagrangian formalism and we can do it only if we are in inertial reference frame. So. So let me introduce it. So this will be our inertial RF reference frame, right? And of course, position of this particle can be described by this position vector R1. Position of this can be defined by the position vector R2, right? And of course, in terms of this, and, and the system has no constraints. So it's a free, two free particles, right? Which uh, moves under the influence of um, forces they exert on each other. And of course, we are going to impose um, sort of restrictions that those forces that they exert on each other are central and conservative. Because most of the time, those forces are what? Electric, force, uh, electric forces and the forces of gravity. And of course, they're both central and conservative. That's what most of the time we work. Or maybe with some <laughs> slight modifications, but they're still central and conservative. <clears throat> okay. All right, so as a result, um, we can write the Lagrangian immediately. So it will be M1 over two R1 dot squared. Ah, yes, yeah, so since there are no constraints, all right, so it means that we need uh, six, it, it, this system has six, deg uh, six degrees of freedom, so we need six coordinates to describe it. Inside of R1, X1, uh, Y1, Z1, and it's instead of R2, X2, X2 Y2, Z2. So six coordinates. Right. Plus <coughs> M2 over 2, R2 dot squared, and minus V, right? We use, yeah, V. It just in the physics too, we use uh, symbol U to denote potential energy. As a result, sometimes uh, <laughs> I get confused which variable we use here or there. Uh, function of R1 and R2. So that's the Lagrangian. Nothing wrong with this Lagrangian. It's correct, it's great and so on. But what is not good about this Lagrangian? <clears throat> and the major problem with this Lagrangian is the fact that it is coupled. What do I mean by coupling, all right? So this term depends on R, R1. This term depends on R2. This guy depends on both R1 and R2. So of course, if you write down Lagrange equations, there go, you're going to end up with two second, okay, not two, more than that, right? Six, six differential equations, right? Second order coupled differential equations. Coupling, I mean, dealing with coupled uh, system, it's not fun, right? Of course, if there is a chance of avoiding it, of course, go and try to uh, rewrite your problem, reformulate, go to some coordinates, right, in order to decouple stuff, right? So let's try to decouple. So the problem is it's coupled. So let me write. Uh, so let's uh, decouple L because that's the uh, problem with this Lagrangian. And in order to decouple, we need to switch, of course, coordinates. We cannot reduce number of general uh, number of coordinates. No way, because there are no constraints. So anyway, we will end up with six coordinates. Right? But 
we will pick the best one. And they are going to be this. So first we are going to introduce the relative position vector, which is r equals to r1 minus r2. Relative position vector will be the first. <coughs> and position of the center of mass. Let's say here we have a center of mass point, and we are going to use this r capital. So three coordinates describing relative position vector r small and three coordinates describing the center of mass right so let me uh right so we're going to move from r1 and r2 to r small and r capital and so let me of course label it so r small it's a relative position vector r1 minus r2 it's a relative position vector oops position vector right okay it's it's time probably soon to change my marker it's still decent but it's giving less and less contrast <laughs> right and of course so yeah we defined uh r and now of course we need to define r capital which you all know of course it's a m1 r oops oops r1 uh, plus m2 R2 and divided by the total mass of the system, right? So that's basically transformation equations, how you can move from R1, uh, no, from, yeah, from R1 and R2 to R small and R capital. But we need to uh, invert this equation. Of course, you can easily invert them. Of course, I'm not going to do it. I will just write down because we need to plug over here R1 and R2. Of course, by, after inversion, you will get uh, this R1 equals r capital and minus yeah minus m2 divided by m1 plus m2 times r so it's a first transformation equation in order to move to r small r capital and the second transformation equation is this r uh, minus uh, m2 okay plus m1 over m1 plus m2 times r so these are transformation equations right <coughs> probably i should frame it so these are transformation equations right. okay so if you use them plug them inside of course uh you will have to differentiate and square this square that of course you will get cross term over there negative and almost exactly the same cross term, but positive from this squaring. As a result, those cross terms will be canceled. And that's how mathematically coupling will be removed from the system. Those cross, ter cross terms will disappear. So, of course, I'm not going to do that simple algebra. I will uh, just, uh, as a result, I will write. So, Lagrangian <coughs> in terms of R small and R capital will look like this. Uh, total mass m capital i will write down in a second so uh, maybe I have about a whole. question yeah <clears throat> did you define r backwards or those equations because just looking at the picture um r1 should be in the direction of r from big r ah, it looks that one, look, in it terms of this r r1 minus r2 okay i didn't look carefully uh so let's see r small plus r2 must give us r1 r small plus r2 give us no it's it looks correct you're talking about this right well if you <clears throat> look at the picture um r1 is at big r plus some scaled little r not minus, not minus. Uh, you mean this one yeah well like in the picture you, if you go from big r you have to add little r scaled to get to r1 and your equation below it you subtract little r you you mean over this over here yeah uh no these are correct these are correct you can you can work it out so these are two equations right so uh get r1 from here plug it there right so and uh, sooner or later you will end up with these equations trust me if i do r1 minus r2 i get minus r if you just look uh, at it Okay. These two equations, uh, if you just subtract them. You mean uh, these two equations? Yeah, do R1 minus R2. 
okay if, if I subtract them okay so uh, subtract it will be r1 minus r2 it will be r and subtracting uh, this will be uh, m1 plus m2 upstairs uh, canceling with that so you will have uh, r on this side r small and r small on that side I'm no getting, you uh, are one minus r2 you get minus r right I'm going R1 minus R2. No, here yes. I'm getting what. Ah, OK, now I see what you mean. If I subtract, uh, I will getting minus, right? Uh, so should it just R1... be 2 minus R1 for R? Is that how you started? OK, OK, so. Um... Because I can look at, uh, I just rewrote from undergraduate level classical mechanics notes. Maybe I made a mistake somewhere in the, in this with the sign. Um, okay, yeah, no, it notes are there, right? Um, so it looks like here should be plus. Is that what you mean? Yeah, either that or redefine R to be the okay, other way. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, right now, it's not a big deal, right? So <laughs> I will look, but it looks like, yeah, because, yeah, you can solve it. And of course, I don't want to now to do it, right? So I just, uh, I just rewrote from my previous semester notes. Um, okay, I will check it. It's just because uh, the notes are over there in the shelf and in here the system covers completely, so I cannot get to there, right? Um, it looks like it should be plus here, right? <clears throat> Okay, probably I just made a mistake rewriting, right? Okay, you can check it. You can check it <laughs> and correct it. <clears throat> right, because it's just an in inversion of these two equations, right? Okay, but thanks for uh, noticing that, right? Because I missed that point. So, um, okay, so total mass. Uh, so it will be m1 plus m2, right? So m over 2 and r capital dot squared and then plus. Okay, reduced mass. Okay, so underneath I will write, uh, of course, the definition of the reduced mass. Mu uh, is, it's a product divided by the total uh, mass of the system. And of course, it's called the reduced mass you've seen it in the past All right so we just naturally uh it just naturally appears in this case and so over here r dot squared and a minus uh, potential energy um as the okay uh, now i realize that i um, need to uh, talk more uh, a little bit more um, in order to uh, make it this transition because right now it's still uh, not good right okay so i forgot to discuss potential energy right so we're going to impose um one restriction so now potential energy let's um First, it's an isolated system, right? And if you preserve the distance between these particles, right, and the orientation, it doesn't matter where you position your system, uh, here, there, there, because it's basically two particles in an empty universe, nothing else, right? So it means that, uh, and of course, potential energy shouldn't depend, uh, obviously, where you position your uh, system of two particles. So it means that it should not depend on R1 and R2. It should depend on R1 minus R2 because the system is isolated and in this case system must be translationally invariant. It's a first um, step simplifying the um, potential energy, right? So let me write, so number one. All right, so number one, uh, any isolated system is translationally invariant 
and I just explained to you, right? Translationally uh, invariant. If you preserve the distance between them and the orientation, it doesn't matter where you position the system, the system will live exactly the same life, right? So potential energy should not depend on the values of R1 and R2. It should depend on the difference, right? So as a result, I can write that V, which is a function of R1 and R2, uh, is equal to the potential energy, which is the function of R1 minus R2. But it's not the whole story. Now we need to impose the second condition. We assumed that the, the forces uh, acting between particles are central and conservative. And in undergraduate level course, we showed, it's a very simple derivation, not the derivation proof, that if a force is central and conservative, then it is automatically uh, spherically symmetric. Spherically symmetric. It means that uh, we can simplify even further. So instead of R1 minus R2, we can put an absolute value sign on this. So it should depend only on the absolute value of R1, and minus, R1 minus R2. Okay, so now let me write it. Which way? Conservative central force. Okay, conservative. Conservative. Uh, central force is spherically invariant. Oh, it's spherically symmetric, I think. Symmetric. Spherically symmetric. Right. Again, uh, proved uh, in the previous semester. So, and we also showed it's not just a force are spherically symmetric, but also potential energy. Actually, first we derived that potential energy is spherically symmetric, and then after some uh, justification, uh, we moved uh, to the fact that uh, force is spherically symmetric. All right, uh, done in uh, undergraduate, in the undergraduate level course, undergraduate course. Okay, so as a result, we can write that V, which was originally a function of R1 and R2, can be written as the uh, V as a function of R1, absolute value of R1 and R2, which is V of R, just the magnitude of a relative position vector. Okay, now I should have... Uh, mention it before I started this, before I started writing the Lagrangian. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and so now uh, we are ready to write this Lagrangian, right? Mm. Okay, L equals M, I reduce mass I wrote, M over 2, R dot squared plus mu over 2 r dot squared and then minus potential energy as a function of the absolute value of the relative position vector. Okay, I can frame it with green because it's not the final form, but preliminary form. All right, there will be three forms of the Lagrangian before we end up with the final form. So next, um, R capital is cyclic. It does not depend on R capital, it depends on R dot. But you remember cyclic or ignorable coordinate, if it doesn't, uh, is, if it's not there explicitly, it's cyclic, right? So, right, since R is cyclic or ignorable, then, of course, the corresponding linear momentum, in this case, of course, it's a linear momentum, right, uh, is conserved, right? Conservation of linear momentum. Then, of course, it leads to uh, conservation of linear momentum. So, basically, uh, m r dot equals to zero, right? Again, you can just write down Lagrange equation, and, of course, that's naturally follows, right? 
So it means that center of mass moves with a constant speed. It's a boring, it's basically uniform translational motion. It's a boring motion. Most of the time people are not interested in that. It's a, uh, it's a middle school stuff, right? To discuss uniform translational motion, right? So of course, uh, since people most of the time interested in the relative uh, motion of this part, uh, motion of these particles relative to each other, of course, that's what we want to get. And that translational motion, let's just hide it. Let's sweep it under the rug. In which way? Let's just move the center, or let's move the origin to the center of mass. And good thing, is, so it will be still uh, in an, an inertial reference frame, because it moves the center of mass was, moves with a constant speed, right? Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's write this. <clears throat> so it's uh, uniform translational motion. So uniform uh, translational motion and of course that's the boring stuff right so let's hide it so that's the idea let's hide it okay it looks like yeah i need to change the marker it's getting <coughs> Drier and drier and drier. Uh, and uh, hide it. Ooh. For a few minutes, it will be difficult to erase. By uh, moving For some time this marker it looks like was upside down so it will take a few minutes to bring it back to senses by uh, moving uh, the origin to uh, center of mass. Okay, as a result, the first term will disappear from the Lagrangian and we will have only that. All right, so L will be equal uh, reduced mass over two R dot squared minus V as a function of R. Okay, so now it looks like, uh, uh, first of all, here, uh, it looked like a Lagrangian of two now new fake particles because particle M capital uh, doesn't exist and particle with the mass of the reduced mass doesn't exist so basically out of our real particle we created two fake particles in this Lagrangian so this Lagrangian looks like a Lagrangian of two fake particles right one position uh, the center of mass and the second is reduced has a reduced mass and now we have Lagrangian over uh, fake only one fake particle mm, nice nice simplification right so now Next, uh, then last step, the last step, right? So what do we have here? So of course our, uh, this is our center of mass point, right? This is our particle, uh, fake particle with mass mu. In a few minutes we will uh, switch back to M, although remembering that uh, that is the reduced mass, right? And what is R small? It's uh, this, this is R. And also at the same time, the force is the central force, right? So force will be along the same line, right? And as a result, it means that torque, torque is zero. So uh, let me write torque. Uh, I don't like this way of denoting torque N, but that's what Goldstein used. So whenever I can't to this point. I, I don't feel comfortable, but it's not a big deal. Uh, torque, as long as you de de define it, denote it, so you can use any symbol you want. 
right uh it's of course r cross f right and since r and f are along the same line so torque will be zero all the time torque is zero then of course we can write immediately that uh, angular momentum is conserved angular momentum is conserved in this case so uh, l is constant okay you see this is kind of i try to write straight l so it's an angular momentum it's not the lagrangian so angular momentum a constant angular momentum right and of course uh, angular momentum we all know it's a okay let me write it in a better way so l equals of course it's a uh, r cross um, p right r cross p and it's constant vector so now let me draw some additional picture so let's say this is l which must be constant and let's say this is the plane perpendicular to that l since l is constant and it's a vector it means that l cannot wobble it must point in exactly the same direction and of course it must have the same magnitude so it means that r and p must lie in this plane which is perpendicular to l because if any of these vectors uh, will go to uh, out of this plane of course l as the cross product will move in a slightly different direction which cannot be because we just showed that the angular momentum is constant so it means that we have here effectively two-dimensional motion every time r and p lies in the same plane all the time you can you should be able to find that plane where r and p lies right <clears throat> so if this is your uh, mu then this is r and this is p so r and p are in the same plane right so r uh, and p are in the same plane so effectively we have two-dimensional motion 2d motion two-dimensional motion and so we can rewrite the Lagrangian in final form so now we convinced ourselves that it's two-dimensional motion so we can uh, use for example uh, polar coordinates to write this uh, r dot explicitly right two-dimensional motion so uh, yeah let's use polar coordinates All right so as a result the Lagrangian will be equal to uh, mu you know what at, at which point probably at this point I should change yeah let me immediately over here change polar coordinate and also let me replace mu with m but of course we still need to remember that m in this case will be uh, is the reduced mass right just at uh, this point goldstein decided okay let's just uh, because we got used to uh, using m so let's just simplify our life at least a little bit right so it will be m over 2 r dot squared so now it's just a absolute value then plus r uh, theta of phi we use the theta here r squared theta dot squared and minus v as a function of r so that's the final form of the lagrangian so now of course i can frame it with red <clears throat> okay so at this point we just need to write a lagrange equations that's it so let me check if i mention everything which i was planning yeah yeah and this is just for convenience Conve for the sake of convenience we make this replacement we are replaced mu with m okay so lagrange equations so it will be d over dt out of dl with respect to 
theta dot equals to the partial derivative of L with respect to theta. Theta is ignorable, right? Cyclic. This zero. And as a result, we're getting conservation of angular momentum, right? From the Lagrange, Lagrangian formalism. <coughs> and we're going to call it, so it will be mr squared theta dot, and let's call it L, L small, <laughs> classical way of denoting that is mr squared theta dot. So, first integral of motion immediately, right? Conservation of angular momentum. <coughs> so, first integral of motion. So, it's a first integral of motion. Okay, let me frame it because from time to time I will have to go back to this equation. And now the second uh, equation, <coughs> of course, d over dt out of partial derivative with respect to r dot equals to the uh, partial derivative with respect to r. Okay, so now let me write it carefully so it will be mr double dot then minus uh, okay I'll move to this side dl over dr dl over dr it will be mr theta dot squared mr theta dot squared right and then minus dv over dr minus dv over dr and it must be equal to zero. I wrote partial derivative, but since V is the function of R only, so we can use straight derivative or partial derivative, so we can interchange whatever you prefer. Right? So it's not a big deal. <clears throat> right, okay, so now, um, of course, of course, so we can also write that force uh, minus partial derivative of v with respect to r is just a force right so we can uh, write this equation in this form so uh, m r double dot ah and another thing which i wanted to uh, employ here look you know what let me uh, get theta dot from here and plug it in the second equation. I just want to combine this equation, theta dot into here, right? And then I will start rewriting it. All right, so uh, theta dot equals L over M R squared, and let's plug it, right? So if you do it, of course, you will end up with the equation which I started writing and then I stopped, right? That will be M R double dot. Then uh, it will be plus, oh no, 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 minus L squared over M R to the power of three, right? So this is F and with minus, I will move to that side with plus. F as a function of R. Okay, so. Uh, basically, this is the equation which we used in undergraduate level course to solve uh, Kepler's problem. Of course, we just used uh, force of gravity over here, then massage this equation, change it, change it slightly in order to get a trajectory. And basically, uh, the whole uh, solution was based on this equation. But different books use different approaches. Right? So Taylor, which I used in the previous semester, he used this equation. But Goldstein, uh, this book right, of this uh, course, he used a different approach. He, uh, we are going to get now the another, the second first integral of motion, which is basically conservation of mechanical energy. And the solution will be based on that integral. So there are, uh, as I said, there are some books which use this second, this second order differential equation to address problems of this type. There are some books which uh, derive that integral from the conservation of mechanical energy.
I wouldn't say that this is more elegant or the previous more elegant. They are both equally equally nice, right? Potato, potato, this. Right. <clears throat> so let me check if I mention everything. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Okay, so let's get the uh, the second first integral of motion. This is the first integral of motion, right? Conservation of angular momentum. Now let's get the second. <clears throat> okay, maybe I will rise. Uh, write this we used uh, this in uh, undergraduate level course in the undergraduate course right. <clears throat> you know what um, I'm afraid I don't like writing over there it's difficult um, and can I start erasing this? Let me check if I need this. I think, yeah, I can start erasing this part. So basically, now we're getting to the uh, integral which we will need in order to discuss scattering. And I didn't feel like just writing down that integral and said and, and just say, okay, uh, some in the previous semester we derived something, but not exactly this, and it's it's too finicky. Right. <clears throat> okay. So uh, now. Uh, Let's get uh, the second first integral of motion. Uh, and from this second order differential equation, basically we just need to differentiate, oh, I mean, we just need to integrate it once, right? The first integral of motion is just integration of the, you can get after integration of the uh, differential equation, of uh, equation of motion, right? Right, um, of course, instead of f, I will go back to uh, minus dv over dr, obviously, right? And um, so let me write it like this, so mr double dot and I'll probably I'll move to that side yeah let me move to the other side right so it will be minus or oh, let me open the bracket so instead of f it will be dv over dr and let me use straight derivative dv over dr and then uh, let me write this also in this form okay you know what let me write d d over dr outside um yeah let me rewrite it one more time so it will be minus d over dr and v function of r. Because we're go I'm going to get d over dr uh, for both terms. Let me take it immediately outside. That's why I decided to rewrite. And then minus, no, plus, plus. And it will be L squared over uh, 2m r to the power of 2. Okay, let's check. This is obvious. If I differentiate this, I will get my two will disappear, minus will appear, get plus and move to that side with minus. Yeah, good. Right. And r to the power of 3. Yeah. So out of this, you can get that easily. Right. And uh, now let me multiply the whole equation by r dot. Just a classical way of differentiating this second order differential equation, right? <coughs> So if you uh, multiply by r dot, uh, you can get this, right? So it will be uh, d over dt, 1 over 2, m r dot squared. Let's see. If we differentiate this with respect to time, uh, 2 will get canceled. First, you will get m r dot. And then you'll have to differentiate one more time. You will get r double dot. So you'll get m r dot r double dot, and that's what we have uh, upstairs. Right? Exactly that. And uh, here, <coughs> since r dot it's a dr over dt. So if you multiply 
the left uh, right hand side by that dr and dr will get cancelled and on this side you will get d over dt as well with minus in front so it will be minus d over dt out of this construction plus l squared over 2 m r squared Okay, so we have d over dt on both sides, so of course we can combine and we're getting something which is <coughs> conserved, right, new construction, which is uh, total mechanical energy. So we can write, so d over dt out of mr dot squared over 2 plus v as a function of r, just moving everything to the left hand side, and plus l squared over 2m r to the power of 2 equals 2, 0, 0. I probably should have skipped this line so and wrote down immediately that it's constant. <coughs> you know what I will do. You can rewrite it. I will uh, save the amount of subspace on the whiteboard. So it's obviously E, we can call it. So we can label it as E, and that is uh, obviously uh, total mechanical energy of the system, right? So it's a total mechanical energy, <coughs> and it's conserved. Yeah, probably I should have also wrote, so it's a equals to a constant. Okay, so that is, that was our first integral, first, first integral of motion. And now this is the second first integral of motion. So we can, of course, frame it, right. So kinetic energy associated with the uh, motion in the R direction, uh, kinetic energy in the phi direction, and potential energy, right. And so now uh, the integral which we want to get, of course, we will extract from here. But before we start extracting that integral, uh, let's introduce a very a uh, useful idea. This construction very often is called the effective potential energy, right? Uh, v effective, right? Which is very useful uh, to analyze behavior of the system qualitatively, right? So if you don't want to solve the problem to gory details, right? So if you want to analyze, yeah, for example, like finding the <coughs> uh, stationary points, see where the system is possible, uh, where the system can exist, where the system cannot exist. Lots of lots of questions. So you can get the direction of forces, right? So you, you can answer the question where the system accelerating, decelerating, all these simple things uh, you can get using just effective uh, potential energy idea, right? So, oh, it's already at 12.15, damn it. Right. Um, I thought I would be able to get uh, to the integral. Okay, uh, let me get at least to the first one. Just a couple of uh, minutes, right? Ah, um, uh, yeah. So v as a function of r plus l squared over two m r squared. So effectively, this is one-dimensional system. Of course, effectively. Of course, in real life, it's two-dimensional. But phi is hidden inside of l, right? All the motion, uh, all the dependence on phi. Right, so it can be used, analyze, uh, can be used to analyze, analyze uh, a system qualitatively. Right, very useful idea. And I think there will be one problem in your homework. Uh, and quite often on the qualifier exam, or I mean the written qualifier exam, some professor will come up with a problem about effective uh, potential energy. <coughs> right. Gee, all right. Um, so what else I wanted to mention? Um, yeah, so another thing which I wanted to mention, so uh, either this approach or using this approach, okay, this approach, right, 
uh, both are equally great. Okay, maybe I should write. So this is the approach number one, and this is effectively approach number two, which can be taken. Right, and again, uh, L. Th this equation is already uh, involved here and involved there. So this and this basically like independent. Right? So you can solve either this or that for two things. Either uh, you can solve for how r uh, depends, <clears throat> how r depends on time, how theta depends on time. In that case, you can see the history of uh, the system, right? You can easily get velocity. So sometimes it's useful, but most of the time people are interested in uh, in the information about the trajectory, how r uh, depends on theta, right? So how r depends on theta. And so that's what we will need in the, pre in the next class in order to discuss, start discussing uh, scattering motion, right? Because when you analyze scattering, you're not interested uh, when the particle was near the atom scattering center or when it, when it hit the uh, target, right, some sensor. No, we just want to know the information about the trajectory, right? So next class, yeah, I will <coughs> first write the integral, which will lead us to uh, to the fact how r depends on time, how theta depends on time, and then we will write the integral, uh, which will give us a trajectory. Right. Okay, I'm not going to hold you any longer because uh, it will it will take like five minutes in order to get these those integrals. So, and after that, we will, uh, as I said, five extra minutes and then scattering. All right.